Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. This is gonna be the first video where I talk about my hero, Jerry Finn. Jerry was a producer, engineer, mixer, and musician who worked with bands such as Green Day, Blink-182, and even Morrissey. He had a plentiful collection of guitars, cabinets, amplifiers, and analog recording gear. If you have ever tried to get the sound of your favorite guitar tone inspired by one of Jerry's productions, it's far more than just adjusting the treble, mid, and bass knobs of your amp, as some of you guitar players in forums like to imagine. Let's get into the details and I'll spill the beans in Jerry's honor and memory, just as I think he would have wanted it. Starting with guitars, Jerry loved many guitars. He would love using American Fenders for cleaner tones and humbucking guitars such as Gibsons for power chords and more distorted sounds. Part of his signature huge guitar tone would be to run the guitar into two amplifiers. This has become common practice for many engineers and producers. Jerry would use a Mesa Boogie high gain amp switcher a now discontinued single rack unit to safely and properly split his guitar signal into the two amps. If you wanna try this yourself, make sure the unit that you try has a buffered input as well as isolated transformer outputs. I recommend the Mesa Boogie Switch Track ABY switcher. Without talking about Jerry's vast collection of boutique and vintage guitar pedals, let's move forward straight to his amplifiers. Jerry loved the sound of classic Marshalls. He would sometimes use this amp for more separated crunch sound coupled with a more modern high gain amp such as a Mesa Boogie Dual Rectifier or a Diesel VH4. The high gain amp would serve more for the sustain and compressed sound whereas the Marshall or similar amp would give the mid-range definitions of the strings for the strums or chords. It's a common misstep when a guitar player gains his amp to the point of intelligibility, especially when making a record. This may work well for metal when you are only playing a few strings at a time or want the sustain, but not so great for punk or rock and roll where you want more definition while digging into the strum. Now let's talk about the guitar cabinets. Jerry would like to blend the tones of different speakers and sometimes blend speakers within a single cabinet. He would often use a pair of Marshall 1960B straight cabinets. Some of his main speakers include Celestian Vintage 30s and various iterations of the Celestian Greenback, including the Medium Magnet 25W and Heavy Magnet 30W versions. Moving right along, Jerry Finn would mix both cabinets with two microphones on each. He would choose the best speaker and blend from each cab and place the mics right next to each other, just off center, where the cone of the speaker meets the dust cap. These mics would be right in front of the grill cloth of the cabinet and as close as he could get them. In some of his earlier work, Jerry would use a blend of Shure SM57s and Neumann U87s, where he would later start to incorporate Royer R121 ribbon microphones. On the Royer, Jerry said this, these are the first mics I've ever used on guitars that give me exactly what I want. Huge low end with no EQ. Jerry would later ditch the two dynamic two condenser mic setup for a two condenser two ribbon mic setup. Later on, while working on the Alkaline Trio album Crimson, engineer Ryan Hewitt would introduce Jerry to the Microtech Cafel UMT-70S, which they ended up using all over the record. This would go on to replace one of Jerry's Neumann U87s on his guitar setup. He loved this microphone because it had more headroom and it would not buckle as fast as his U87s in front of a loud distorted guitar amp. The Microtech Cafel UMT-70S is a transformerless mic that features the famous Neumann M7 capsule. Microtech Cafel has deep ties with Neumann, originally being part of the company. Some even say that they are the true current day Neumann. I highly suggest you check out their microphones because they are some of the best. From there, we get into Jerry's amazing microphone preamplifier setup. Jerry would like to use the Manly Labs Dual Mono Tube Mic Pre's and or Chandler Limited Abbey Road EMI TG2 Mic Pre's for guitar. Jerry said this about the TG2's. My first choice for almost every application and I can't imagine making a record without it. He also liked to keep the cable runs as short as possible, bringing the preamps into the room and as close to the instruments and mics as he could. From here, Jerry would like to sum his four mic guitar track setup down to one track remaining in the analog domain. He would do so not only to commit to the sound, but to also get what he felt was the best sound he could. This would usually be achieved by one of Jerry's prized possessions, his Neve BCM-10 sidecar. This is a small but uber cherished and revered analog recording console, which includes 10 channels of the famous and original Neve 1073 preamp and EQ modules. It should also be noted that the BCM-10 was equipped with Neve 1272s in the line amp section. This console allowed Jerry to sum the four tracks to one where he could further process. He would then often EQ the guitar track with a Manly Labs Poltec equalizer. And of course, being able to use one over four has its practical advantages. This unit is Manly's licensed version of the famous EQP-1A Poltec, which is a passive tube equalizer from the 50s. And let me just say that if there was ever a plugin or piece of software that was furthest from the sound of the hardware, the Poltec is the king and ground zero. No plugin has ever come close to the magic of a Poltec. 
Anyone who has said or says otherwise is either a fool, a liar, or both. Now back to the show. Lastly in Jerry's chain was his preferred printing slash recording medium, the not-to-be-underestimated tape machine. He would prefer some of the best tape machines ever made, either the Studer A800 or A827 models. Even in hardware attempts, I just don't think that tape is something you can fake. But we'll talk about that in another video. In an interview asking Jerry what his 10 essential recording tools were, tape was number one. It's been said that Jerry wanted nothing to do with vanity or fame. Music was his passion. He just wanted to make great records. As an unfortunate byproduct of this, sadly, there is very little information documented about Jerry Finn. It's also been said by people such as Mark Hoppus of Blink-182 that unlike many audio engineers, Jerry would always be very excited and open to reveal his techniques to those in his presence who were lucky enough to ask. The things I've learned about Jerry have been through years of study and reverse engineering. I urge anyone who watches this video who knew Jerry or would like to share a story or piece of information about him to please do so. Or you could always reach out to me personally on my email via my page. Jerry Finn was like a shooting star, gone too soon, but burned incredibly bright. Thanks for watching.